Yeah, I talk a lot about the story of self. This story is becoming obsolete. It's becoming no longer true. We don't resonate with it anymore. And it's actually generating crises that are insoluble from the methods of control. And that's what's clearing space, clearing the space for us to step into a new story of self and a new story of the people. This movement against the Keystone XL pipeline, the Occupy movement, Arab Spring, these are all signalers of the emergence of the world's biggest and most profound social movement. And out of that love and that connection of people to each other, they're going to create a different way to do things. It is a holiness um, to the temple that is beautiful and sacred, and I love being a part of that. Very much like the playa, the temple is really the blank canvas for all of the things that we are carrying with us. Tamira is a research center for peace. It's a community with a huge vision of shifting the entire culture of this planet from one of war to one of peace. Even to start thinking about what that is, is a huge step. I don't want to live in a world where I'm not a brilliant businesswoman living out my dreams and a DJ that makes music and talks about vaginas and sex, which is a complete and utter lie because I am exactly both of those things. Thank you all for um, being here at this uh, incredible event. Um, so I come to you uh, actually from pretty far away, from the west coast of Canada. Um, my family comes from a background, uh, English and Irish in origin. And I was born uh, right near the traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, uh, just outside what the um, newer arrivals call Vancouver. And um, I really made it my life's mission uh, to try to find these pieces of this emergent culture that I think are sprouting up all around the world. Uh, I mean, in places like Tamara, places right here at New Frontiers, and um, really tried to look at, you know, how can I um, gather in these, these, th these seeds uh, and really capture them and amplify them in a particular medium. In this case, um, for me, most of it is, is films. And, uh, you know, re more recently, I really started to become aware of, I think, the, the process by which uh, I went about this, you know, this journey. A lot of the film clips you just saw, sometimes I even forget what I worked on because I just seem to be um, kind of going from one piece to the next as it just um, becomes apparent that this is the next step. Um, this, this kind of um, new technology, you could say, uh, intuitive technology, one word for it is synchronicity. And uh, one definition of synchronicity is really uh, that it's sort of this higher order, perhaps, that you know, a lot of us may not necessarily be able to draw the, the connections to. We might not say, well, clearly, you know, that led to that, which led to that, and that's how I made it here. Um, but really, this kind of surrender into that, that there's this deeper unfolding going on of which we were all part, and that perhaps just as, as Benjamin talked about this uh, idea of knowing truth, you know, when there's that shared space of truth between us. At the same time, I think all of us know when we're, we're on the path, you know, on the path of like, ah, yes, this is the next thing, you know, that I'm, that I'm supposed to do, uh, as, we as we all awaken to service um, towards this more beautiful world. Uh, my story really begins uh, as far as filmmaking. Um, this screenshot there is from the uh, TED talk I gave actually where um, I came out with the Occupy mask on um, because for me it really represented both, on the one hand, you know, my, grand, my grandmother <laughs> said it was, it was kind of creepy, um, the Occupy mask, but at the same time it, it actually represented to me uh, one of the core memes, I think, of the, the time that we're in, uh, which is this energy of this, this trickster. This idea that, um, you know, we don't really know exactly uh, how to get where we're trying to go and uh, I think this combination of imagination and creativity and maybe a bit of irreverence, in fact, is this sort of you know, uh, audacious um, possibility that we can uh, be in service. 
And for me, uh, one big piece for that was actually recognizing, um, after re uh, reading the book by Charles Eisenstein, named Sacred Economics, uh, in the end of that book, he actually has this passage where he says, you know, if you're in a position where you have any sort of uh, a surplus, let's say, any kind of, you know, anything really, the best thing you can do now is invest it back in, in this more beautiful world. Um, and for me, at the time, this is back in 2011, I thought, well, you know, honestly, I could scrape together enough to buy a plane ticket out to, to visit Charles because I had this idea that I could make a film. I make a film about his book, Sacred Economics. Uh, that's as far as I got. I, I Skyped him the next day and I said, hey, Charles, uh, I'd love to come and, and shoot this film with you. Can I, can I come stay at your place? And he said, sure. <laughs> and then he said, wait, no, I got to ask my wife. <laughs> and then he went and asked her and then he's like, yeah, okay, you know, you can, you can do it. So I came out there and I really just, um, just tried to be in a deep place of listening, of like, what is, it, you know, what is this film that, that I feel needs to be born but not knowing how to make it? Uh, and at the same time, the Occupy movement actually erupted on the scene. That um, basically while I was out there shooting, all of a sudden New York was you know, aflame with um, this, the seeds of this movement, and he was asked to come speak there. And so I ended up following him, of course, that was a thing to do, uh, down to Wall Street, uh, where there was this moment, I think, of recognition where um, I believe it was Nomi Klein who had this beautiful quote where she said, you know, while a lot of the commentators at the time, and particularly in the US, were saying, I don't know what these you know, hippies need or want you know, with their bongo drums, and nobody knows what they want. Uh, whereas Naomi Klein said, well, the rest of the world is saying, what took you so long? That there was this deep um, recognition, almost emergent you know, vision among all of these different groups that for so long have felt like they were alone, like they were the ones kind of toiling away and nobody else seemed to, um, to also be in service. And well, that was one of the moments I think we all recognized, like, ah, yes, like so many of us share this uh, conceptions of this, this world. And that maybe for the first time then, a lot of these groups started to see each other and started to link up. And you know, for me, that also led to uh, this invitation I got to go to Tamara. Because after seeing that film, uh, they, they reached out and they said, oh, we're doing some really amazing work here with these new models for the future. Uh, you know, would you be interested in coming out to check it out? And it was actually four years before I had enough spaciousness uh, and time to, to get out there, um, which became the seeds of the film clip you saw there uh, called Healing of Love, which is really looking at, again, their models in, in love and partnership uh, in the wider framework of trying to build this new peace culture. Um, since then as well, I've made uh, Amplify Her, you saw a little bit there, which for me is really this question of um, what is it about this rising feminine you know, that clearly seems to be uh, it could be one of these emergent threads of this new world. Um, also, how do we ground it in the experiences of real women? In this case, uh, because of my own experience in the electronic music scene, I thought, oh, interesting. Like, how is it showing up for female DJs and producers? Um, and what is it that they're grappling with uh, themselves as women in this time and the feminine? And how is that actually, again, applicable off across so many, uh, so many realms that we're seeing? Uh, that film is actually coming out this summer, I'm proud uh, to say. And um, hopefully it'll be premiering somewhere nearby. I'd love for you to come visit. So how do we understand the time we're in? Uh, there's this writer named Jonah Sachs from San Francisco. He wrote a book called Winning the Story Wars. Uh, he also created a company called Free Range Studios. And they have some of the most uh, brilliant pieces of social activist video. Uh, one is called The Story of Stuff, which some of you may have seen. Uh, the Matrix, Grocery Store Wars, lots of these beautiful pieces um, that really aimed at, at kind of uh, creating these, these pieces around this new story, or understanding at least, you know, what is the depths of the old story that we're in. Uh, and in this book, he wrote about this thing called the myth gap, where uh, just as the myths that have guided, you know, are, are the, the dominant civilization for so long, they're really beginning to break down. And that uh, perhaps 2012, you know, if anything, that that was really a, a key point where all of the unintegrated shadow of the dominant culture was now to be uh, brought to light. And that in fact, you know, this whole idea of the end of time or the end of um, you know, apocalypse for the world was really this question of, again, are we willing to actually face the shadow of, of the dominant culture? And what is that actually going to catalyze? It has it catalyzed, I think, in, in all of us here and in, in this world we're trying to build. And so you could almost say that we, we do have a crisis of stories. We have a crisis of myths with which we can um, 
really live into, in fact, for this, um, for this world. I think we can obviously look to the past. There's um, tremendous wisdom, of course, in the peoples that have been uh, living in a proximity to the land and in relationship for a long time. And yet, even then, uh, you know, with the, the whole monolithic uh, civilization built upon it, again, it's a different time that we're in. And maybe what's being asked of us um, isn't to go back, of course. But again, how do we actually uh, go along together? This is the thing that's also different. This is a word called the noosphere. Um, it was coined almost 100 years ago. Uh, but really what it refers to is, just as we have these different layers encircling the globe, such as the geosphere, uh, the biosphere, uh, some might even say the technosphere, which is the sphere of the sort of technological landscape that we've created, uh, there's the noosphere, which can be seen as the layer of human consciousness around the planet. Uh, this is really something, of course, that's new, at least new from a technological perspective. Some um, might argue that maybe there's already a psychic sphere that maybe we've lost our ability to, um, to access. Um, but this emergence of the noosphere is actually, it's unprecedented, and I think it's really important to understand actually what opportunities now this actually provides. Um, just as, you know, the latest video of a cat falling out of a tree or Gangnam Style might rick rocket around the planet, uh, I believe Gangnam Style is up to something like four billion views or something, right, on YouTube. And on the one hand, you could say, oh, that's, that's silly. You know, why are we again sharing something um, silly kind of Korean pop culture video? And yet what I see is the very possibility that that video could be seen so many times says something about how interconnected we've now become. And in fact, I think we have the real possibility of uh, consciously creating these memes. There's one word for them. Uh, consciously creating memes and then uh, injecting them in, into the noosphere in a way of accelerating uh, this more beautiful world. And I want to spend a little bit of time around this idea of mind bombs. So uh, I sat with the a founder of Adbusters magazine, uh, which is actually the fellow who is credited with coining, or at least branding, the Occupy movement. Their Adbusters magazine, based out of Vancouver, was the one that actually um, put a full page spread in their magazine and said, based upon and inspired by Egypt, what was going on in Tahrir Square, had said, uh, you know, what if we decided to occupy Wall Street? And they had this big spread that said, September 17th, bring tent. And that was really it. I mean, there was some on the ground, you know, activists that they'd been contacted were sort of seeding this momentum. But really, they didn't, you know, they didn't necessarily know exactly how it would play out. And yet, just that spark, I think, was able to ignite a lot of this latent, you know, longing, in fact, to, to really participate uh, in, this, in this unfolding. Uh, when I spoke to this fellow named Kelly Lassen, he's the, he's the founder of Adbusters, uh, and I asked him, what do you think, where should the Occupy movement go next? This is back now in 2012. And he said, oh, we forget Occupy. Like, what's next? Again, his understanding about what he was doing and the way of actually creating these, these mind bombs was that they serve for a time. That, in fact, the most responsive uh, expression or articulation uh, of a certain meme is very specific to a time. And once that moment's passed, again, we don't get attached to form. That in fact we say, ah, okay, that was, that was beautiful at the time, and then recognize, you know what? It never was about camping out in a park or the financial district. It's not about that. But in that moment, it was the most brazen, you know, revolutionary thing that, that we could do. Uh, and since then, we've actually seen other expressions um, take over. Uh, for instance, in Canada, that started uh, the Idle No More movement. A lot of the indigenous activists there were able to catalyze this wave, uh, both in North America and I think abroad as well. Uh, as well in the US, there's the Black Lives Matter. Again, this idea of like, how do we galvanize um, a type of shift by really um, harnessing the power and tapping into this uh, noosphere? And I think now the question is upon us as well. I mean, I start getting obsessed, of course, with this idea that there's such a thing as the perfect, you know, mind bomb that is the thing, is the one thing that can be uh, uh, shared into the noosphere, and, and that's the transformation, you know, from that one piece. Very likely not going to be like that. Um, I think the deep uh, lesson that all of us are learning here and, and other gatherings around the world is that um, there is unity in diversity. And in fact, we need a diverse, um, uh, we need diverse expressions of this new story, 
but all shared, I think, within this holistic framework that they're all trying to articulate something of which no single thing can possibly uh, do it justice. And so I want to share uh, just as sort of key storytelling strategies, you know, for all of you who may already be storytellers in some fashion, whether you're aware of it or not, uh, or if you want to um, look at really crafting consciously these, these memes, these mind bombs around your own work, which is so necessary. Just here's a very brief um, best practices. Uh, short's better than long. <laughs> You'd be surprised, you'd be surprised. I mean, you heard Benjamin speak about how at Planetary, the first 20 minutes just reduced him to tears, and like many others. Whereas the rest of it, um, you know, again, was maybe just secondary to that initial incarnation of the beauty and the love that we have for this place. And maybe that alone, right, could have been enough of, a, of an offering, let's say. Um, also, again, in this kind of world that's constantly competing for attention, you'd be surprised, or maybe you, you aren't, that if you are sent a video, or you open one up, What's the first thing you do? You look at how long it is. Exactly. And if it's usually longer than two or even three, you might say, ah, uh, maybe later. You know, maybe I'll file it away for later. And of course, maybe you never go back. Uh, so short is better. Uh, the next thing is distill the meme. And by this, I mean, again, connect what you're expressing, even though that'll have a specific expression about the particular thing you're doing, whether it's integrated agriculture um, or um, water retention landscapes or things, it's important to also distill, like, what is the, what is the core myth that you're actually tying it to, um, that this expression is, is a part of? Um, Charles Eisenstein in Sacred Economics, I mean, for me, and what I, what I tried to express in that was, um, he articulated very beautifully that the old story of which so many of our institutions are built on, including the economic system, is the story of independence. You're, you're an independent being in an indifferent universe driven to maximize your own self-interest and so forth. Uh, and so we built an economic system based on that core myth. Um, what would an economic system look like based on another myth? And he's called it, and many others, uh, the myth of the interdependent being, where now the money system is in service and actually to creating systems uh, which reinforce and, in fact, enact that type of interdependence. It's very possible. And in that particular book, he goes over very specific strategies. But I think it's important that, um, again, as we don't, as we, we go forth with the very specific work that we're trying to do, to not get lost in the details when we're trying to convey it to other people. Because just like, for instance, permaculture, um, for me, is such a deep reordering about our understanding of nature uh, that it becomes one of courtship instead of domination. Right? Again, those types of core memes are like, whoa. Uh, and they have to be in there. And I got the time up, so I'm just finished quickly. Uh, finally, think about film as a tool that, in fact, uh, sacred economics I crafted deliberately for people who were already doing the work on the ground and needed something in which to galvanize people to get involved. And so they could use the film as a tool and say, oh, this is the kind of core frame. Now, you know, in our own regional areas, how do we make this happen you know, right here? So I encourage you to think about, again, as you're crafting these, these stories, um, how are they used as tools for people to really bring this more beautiful world home? Uh, and lastly, these three things are really um, uh, alive for me right now. Again, what is the role of healing the masculine um, in this you know, culture of, of ending of patriarchy? Um, the role of decolonization and re-indigenization, actually, for so many of us that have lost connect, contact with our own ancestral roots. Uh, and finally, what is the role of grief, in fact, about the time we're in, the necessary role that doesn't say, you know, collapse in a heap of it's all over, nothing to be done, but how does it actually inform our way of being human in the world today? And lastly, this idea of living from the future. I think we, we do, as we're trying to create this more beautiful world, we can really get involved in this idea that um, we, if we just get to here, you know, everything will be okay. And if we don't, everything's over, it's done. And I think it's important to understand that the world over, we're going through collapse, we're going through regeneration, we're going through you know, multiple iterations of story, and it's not happening everywhere all at once. And in fact, uh, that the future in this way becomes a willingness to be in the world now as if we're already there. What does it look like to be in the world and with each other uh, from that place? Thomas Hubel, this spiritual teacher from Austria, he says, uh, it's uh, living from the future is embodying the future consciousness now. And in that way, we're already there. So, thank you.